next thing that we're going to talk about is the spring force. So we've talked about certain forces in chapter five, um, the normal force, the tension, uh, gravity, and so on. Uh, we're going to talk about one more force that we'll see a lot throughout this course, and that is the spring force. So this is a spring. I'm sure all of you have seen springs before, right? Um, what happens if you, if you extend a spring? So when you extend a spring, the spring tries to get back to its original configuration, to its unstretched length, right? So that's what we've done in the second diagram. We've pulled the spring out to a certain distance. So let's say that this is the unstretched length of the spring. And so we have stretched the spring out by a certain distance. So now, now the spring has been stretched out. Uh, okay, so sorry, let me just, uh, let me just draw, draw my own diagram. So suppose you have a spring, which is attached to a wall, right? And this, the end of the spring is right here and uh, it's sitting on a frictionless surface. And now the spring is not stretched. So it's in its relaxed state, uh, in its uh, equilibrium uh, configuration is what, it, what, it, what it's called. Now, suppose uh, you take a, there's a mass or something attached over here. And let's say that you stretch the spring out now until it's over here. What you're gonna find is that the spring is pulling back, right? Because it doesn't like being stretched. It just wants to get back to its equilibrium configuration. So you will find that the spring is pulling back with the force F, right? I'll call this Fs to remind us that this is the force exerted by the spring. So when you stretch a spring, the spring wants to, the spring pulls back, right? And you know from experience that if you want, if you stretch the spring out more, it's gonna pull back even more, right? So the more the spring is stretched, the more it's gonna pull back. Now, the same thing applies for compressing a spring. So instead of pulling the spring out like this, suppose you squeeze the spring and so the end of the spring is over here. I'm still talking about the same spring, but this time it's been squeezed and the end of the spring is over here, right? Okay, so this is the amount that you've squeezed the spring by. Then what's gonna happen is the spring is gonna push to the right this time because it doesn't like being squeezed either. So it's going to push back and Fs is now gonna be in this direction, right? So the force is gonna be zero if you've neither squeeze, squeezed nor extended the spring or not stretched the spring. But if you either squeeze the spring or stretch the spring, there will be a force uh, exerted by the spring uh, because the spring will try to get back to its original configuration. That makes sense? All right. So that is the, that force which is exerted by a spring is called the spring force, right? Okay. So uh, yeah, this first diagram is showing that a compressed spring exerts a pushing force and a stretched spring exerts a pulling force. Okay, that's what this diagram is showing. All right, now a gentleman named Hook, Robert Hook, um, studied springs extensively and came up with a mathematical equation uh, expressing the spring force. So essentially what he found was this, that suppose this first spring is unstretched, right? And then you stretch the spring by a certain amount. You've stretched the spring by an amount delta x. So this distance is delta x. So what Hook found from a bunch of experiments is that the force exerted by the spring is directly proportional to the amount of stretch. So F is proportional to delta x, right? And what does the minus sign signify here? It just tells us that the force will be opposite the direction of delta x. So we are using a right is positive sign convention over here. So when you stretch the spring out, delta x is a positive quantity, right? Um, because you're stretching to the right. And so the force will be to the left. And that's why you have that minus sign over there. So f is equal to minus um, k times delta x. And k is just a constant of proportionality. Constant of proportionality proportionality, that's a really long word, okay. Um, and it depends on the spring, right? It has a name, it's called the spring constant, 
and the significance of the spring constant uh, is it's a measure of the stiffness of the spring. So if the spring constant is large, that's a very stiff spring. If the spring constant is small, that's a very loose spring, right? So regardless of the value of k, what Hook found was that the force is directly proportional to delta x, and uh, the constant of proportionality is k times delta x. And this also applies when the spring is squeezed. So in if the spring is squeezed, like if you push the spring in, now the delta x is going to be a negative number, right? And so the force will be to the right. If delta x is negative, the force will be positive. It will be to the right. And if delta x is positive, the force will be uh, negative, which means to the left. So the minus sign helps us keep track of the direction of the force. Now, one thing that we usually do for convenience, uh, so we've seen that F is equal to minus K times delta X. That's Hooke's law. For convenience, what we do almost always is we choose the equilibrium position of the end of the spring. Um, so suppose this is the spring and it's not been stretched. It's really, I, I could use this diagram to yeah, I'll just make a new diagram. Okay. So this is our unstretched spring. So the equilibrium pos position of the end of the spring is almost always taken to be x equals zero. We choose our origin over there, right? If we choose the origin over there, then now if I stretch the spring by a certain amount till here, the amount of stretch, which was the delta x, which we called delta x before. Remember, delta x is just x final minus x initial. But since our x initial is 0, delta x just becomes x, right? x final minus x initial. But we chose our x initial to be 0. So delta x is just x in that case, right? And so Hooke's law becomes a little simpler. You get f is equal to minus kx. But remember that this simplified form comes at a cost. It's uh, This is only true when uh, the equilibrium position is where the origin is. So uh, when the spring is unstretched, x is going to be 0 in that case. That that clear to all of you? All right. So any questions? No questions? All right, okay. Um, I have a small question. Yeah, go ahead. What if the spring has different, like a different constant throughout? Uh, like what if, if the, spring, the yeah. spring is really thick at one part and then condensed and then it like unwinds and get that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, that, that's quite possible. Uh, but even then, it will have an overall spring constant. So you're saying that the spring is very thick over here and then gets loose over here. Uh, you can still, it will still have an overall K uh, based on its configuration. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay, so the overall K will be constant, right? Uh, it, so this, the K of this spring would be different from the K of this spring, which is thick, uh, or, or the K of this spring, um, which is quite loose. So it'll be somewhere in between the Ks of these two other springs, but it will still have its own overall K. That makes sense? Okay, very good question. Okay, now the spring force is actually a very important force because it explains the normal force. Now, when we talked about the normal force earlier, so what was the normal force? So, so what I claimed was I, I'm, I, I put this heavy box or a book or something on a table. What was the normal force? I said that the normal force is a force exerted by the table on the book, right? Fn. Now, if you think about it, you might not have really bought that. Like you might have thought that, I mean, what does he mean when he says that the table is exerting an upward force on the on the object? Uh, like the table is an inan inanimate object, so how inanimate thing? So how would it exert an upward force? Uh, like if if I'm if I say that I'm exerting a force on my phone, right? I'm physically pushing the phone upwards. But if the phone is sitting on the table and there is an upward force exerted by the table, uh, where is that happening? Like the table is just this dead inanimate object. When is it pushing upwards on the, on the phone, right? Uh, 
actually that can be explained the origin of the normal force can be explained by the spring force how well if you think of solids uh, how the atoms are organized inside solids uh, you can think in terms of this very simple ball and spring model so this model is very simple but it's actually quite useful so you can think of the atoms as these little balls these these uh, hard rigid spheres and they're connected to each other by springs and the springs model the intermolecular force between the atoms right so you can think of the uh, of the solid as being made up of these uh, atoms which are connected by small strings and this is a surprisingly good model it works really really well uh, even in very advanced classes we start with this model um, the you you so these infinitesimally tiny balls connected by these stiff springs so if you think of the solid like that what happens when you place this book on the tabletop right what happens is uh, some of these springs are squeezed and some of these springs are stretched when you place the book on the tabletop right and so these stretched and squeezed springs exert forces and that is the origin of the normal force. So that is the reason why you have a normal force. Because if you think of the surface, instead of thinking of the surface like the way you see it, like this tabletop, just visualize it as a bunch of uh, hard spheres which are connected by these stiff springs, right? And you're placing the book on top of that. And so some of the springs will squeeze, some of them will stretch, like as you can see over here, and the stretched and squeeze springs will all exert forces and all of those forces together manifest as the normal force as an upward force acting on the uh, on the object so that is the molecular origin of the normal force is that completely clear to all of you and so with that same idea you can also explain tension so we talked about how when you have a stretched cord and you're pulling on two ends of the cord like so you're pulling this let's say it's connected to these two boxes, you're pulling this uh, box and somebody else is pulling this box. Now there will be a tension force which prevents you from stretching the cord. So why, did, why does this tension force arise? For exactly the same reason, you can think of the atoms inside the cable as the same way as these little balls which are connected by springs, very stiff, stiff springs. And so when you try to stretch the cable out, these springs get stretched, right? And stretched springs always pull back and they're trying to get back to their original length. And so that force is what you perceive as the tension force. 